only have three main goals for this presentation. I want to expound some thoughts regarding the substance of the definition of faith. And I want to add additional information about faith's relationship to epistemology, which is going to be a little on the lighter side. I didn't want to get too technical, um, but we can do that in the Q&A if you guys want. And the main goal I hope to accomplish is to expound upon what exactly faith is. And I really want to ameliorate tensions between having faith um, as something with or without evidence. I want to bring up definitions about the historical um, kind of changeover that we've seen recently and what faith means to most people, especially even in the dictionary. And I want to talk about, does faith involve evidence? And I'm going to give, uh, I'm going to try and give a cursory argument that C.S. Lewis gave on this topic. So that's, that's my kind of strategy for tonight. Um, so the question, I guess, is what is faith? That's the first question. So famously, Mark Twain said, uh, faith is believing what you know ain't so. And um, I think that's flatly false, though I do think that a lot of Christians buy that nowadays. Uh, by the way, my, my presentation is going to be primarily addressed to Christians. If you're not one, I'm sorry, um, in, in every sense. Uh, <laughs> if you're not one, try not to feel left out. I really just want to make sure that you guys are, uh, are, are on the same page with me because I've got a pretty specific set of goals for tonight. So let's see. Uh, another example of somebody uh, thinking about faith in modern times would be Richard Dawkins. He said, faith is the great cop-out, the great excuse to evade the need to think and to evaluate evidence. Faith is belief in spite of, even perhaps because of the lack of evidence. Now, th the real question here, I guess, is like, why does he think so? And I kind of, I kind of don't get it. I, I kind of don't. I really don't understand why people get that impression. I think it probably has to do with Western Christian culture. I have my uh, theories, but let's get into it a little bit more. Oh. Um, John Lennox, who is also a modern scholar, he, he's around, he's still around today, who's actually debated Dawkins. He claims one of the biggest battles for our culture is the definition of faith. What does it mean to believe? Faith has been redefined to mean belief where there is no evidence and that is dangerously wrong. So he's flatly contradicting Dawkins here. And he's a scientist himself, a mathematician and a philosopher and a scientist. I think he has three PhDs. Somebody said he has more letters after his name than he does in his name. And I guess he thought that was pithy, so he says it sometimes. But that's another example of uh, someone who disagrees with Dawkins. And then we have my favorite definition of faith, which is C.S. Lewis's own, which is faith is the art of holding on to things your reason has once accepted in spite of your changing moods. And I think that that's a unpopular assertion, not because it lacks merit, but because it's just not the sort of thing that people think of when they think of faith. They don't think of faith in transit. They think of faith as assent to propositions in some sense. It's the original sort of grasping of a piece of information and saying, I buy that. Um, but I think that Lewis is hanging on something important and I'll get to that a little bit later. So what does the dictionary say? That's usually where you go to solve problems with, uh, with definitions like this. Um, this is just a screenshot from the Merriam-Webster dictionary on faith and it's irritatingly inconsistent. And uh, the definition of faith begins um, if you guys can see, can you guys see my mouse pointing at things or no? You can? Yep. Okay. So the definition of faith, uh, allegiance or duty to a person or loyalty is the first thing. Fidelity. Fide is the root of Latin. Fide just means trust. And fides is exactly where you'd be looking. And fidelity to one's promises is a little, it's pretty circular. That's just the Latin word. And it's like faith is faith to one's promises. That's a, you, you shouldn't do that. And then uh, down a, a little further right here is where I, I find it kind of frustrating. Um, in 2B, it's a firm belief in something for which there is no proof. Um, that might be true, but I don't know what they mean by proof. And it makes it more interesting when you get right here, when they say the doctrines of a religion and God, belief or trust in God, and then it's like where there's no proof. So let's go a little bit further. Um, this is also on the Merriam-Webster uh, Merriam site. Um, belief, faith, credence, and credit. They're going to talk about these kind of four things within the bracket of the idea of faith. Um, what we're looking at is these definitions in this order. So I want to look at this first. Faith almost always implies certitude, even when there is no evidence or proof. So in the original definition, if you want to go back a couple, it's, it's where there's no proof. And now it's no evidence or proof. 
And they just keep ratcheting up all the things you don't know in order to have faith on things. And I'm, I'm reading this and I'm just like, that's frustrating, right? So then let's move on to credence. Credence suggests intellectual assent without implying anything about the grounds for assent. And notice here uh, on an unshakable faith in God is the one with no evidence or proof. And then the one with credence is uh, a theory now given credence by scientists. And it's like, oh, okay. So we can get the impression of what the writers thought here. And then we have uh, credit, which is, I didn't highlight it all the way, but it may simply assent or grounds other than direct proof um, they gave full credit to the statement of a reputable witness. So going off of just this dictionary definition, um, what are we going to see? Um, it, as Christians, if you're a Christian, if you're a theist, if you're a, if you're a deist or a theist or something like this, probably a theist. If you're a Christian, you're a theist. Um, if you're a theist, what would, um, what would you say about God? And if you're a Christian, what's the biblical data about faith in this regard? Um, which of these would it most likely apply? Now, I get the impression that a lot of Christians would say it's the top one. It's just belief without any evidence or proof or anything whatsoever. And then you have credence or credit. And credence is just implying, well, we don't know what the evidence is, but it's still an assent to that proposition. Or it, it could be credit, which is the act of trusting the source, which is tried and true. And I'm going to argue that it's going to be credit for the biblical data. And I'll give you a couple examples as to why I think so. Okay, so what are some examples from scripture? Um, oh, and to be clear, I'm not claiming that we don't have faith or that we should change the word faith for credit or something like that. It's not some substitute. I'm just looking at the term faith and how we can use uh, what the scriptures seem to imply faith is. Uh, we ought to have faith, but not in the popular sense of the word today. I think that that sense is wrong. So let's first look at Hebrews 12, uh, 1 and 2. If you have your Bibles, open up. Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Okay, so I want to point out something that stuck out to me here. Um, it's the therefore since language. And right in the beginning, we see a therefore since. So therefore is the transition word. And since is like, because of what came before, this is what we're going to do now. And what came before is Hebrews 11. And if you know, uh, if you know any uh, scripture, does, if anybody knows, uh, the hall of faith comes right before this. Um, the hall of faith includes Noah's acts of faith, no, uh, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, David, Rahab, ton of people are just ran through about all the ways that they trusted God and they received some sort of reward for it, even though they didn't receive the promise of Christ. But we're having here, we're seeing it. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. So in the scripture, we seem to be being appealed to by the writer of Hebrews to look at the evidence of what these people did. And then we ought to act accordingly. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow and lose heart. So it's an imprecation on the reader for what they just read. And I feel like that's an appeal to evidence. Okay, so second example, we have Thomas. Um, he was one of the 12, uh, but he was not with the disciples when Jesus came. This is a pretty famous story. I don't need to recount the whole thing. But basically what happens is Thomas uh, isn't there when Jesus shows up his, in his resurrected body. And they say, hey, we saw the Lord to Thomas. And he goes, I'm not gonna believe it until I feel him with my hands, until I touch and handle him, I'm not doing it. So Jesus shows up later when Thomas is there and says, touch me, handle me, and basically just proves that it's like, I was here the whole time. I, I witnessed what you just did. And you should have believed me in advance. He says, because you have seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. But this is tricky for my argument, because if I'm right, and Christians ought to believe on evidence, and I'm going to argue that faith even involves what we know and what we believe, then why is it that the Lord himself seems to tell Thomas that it would have been greater for him to have less evidence. It would have been better for him to do that. That's going to be tricky for my argument, but I want to say three things about that. First, um, Thomas is mentioned in all four gospels, uh, but he only speaks in John, which is a little weird, but I thought it was kind of interesting to mention. But the main thing is he was in all four gospels. He's not some background player. In fact, in John eleven sixteen, 16, he's present when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Uh, he famously said, Jesus says he's dead and we're going to go see him. And Thomas goes, well, let's go that we may die with him. And he says it like very sarcastically. So he's there when Lazarus gets raised from the dead. 
Um, and also he's there in, um, in Matthew 10, when Jesus sends out the 12 to heal and exercise demons and all this crazy stuff. So in effect, um, let me see here. Basically, um, what I want to say is given this evidence, he saw Jesus raise the dead. He saw Jesus predict his own death. He, in direct answer to one of uh, Thomas's questions, Jesus claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life. Like he claimed all of these things to Thomas. And last but not least, all of his best friends in the inner circle of Christianity, in the inner circle of the apostles, all told him, we saw the Lord. And he goes, I don't believe you. So in effect, given those facts, he ought to have known better. And this is exactly what C.S. Lewis is saying here. He's saying that blessed are those who have not seen and believed has nothing to do with our original ascent to Christian propositions. It was not addressed to a philosopher inquiring whether or not God exists. It was addressed to a man who already believed that, who already had long acquaintance with a particular person. The evidence that that person could do very odd things and then who refused to believe one odd thing more, often predicted by that person and vouched for by all of his closest friends. It is a rebuke not to skepticism in the philosophical sense, but to the psychological quality of being suspicious. It says, in effect, you should have known me better. And I believe that's exactly what Jesus is saying. But a lot of times people will use this verse to try and say that like, we ought not try and seek out reasons to believe in God. We ought not seek out reasons to increase our confidence and trust in God. And I find that frustrating given all of the evidence that surrounds this. So let me give one more biblical um, and basically, I'm just saying the point is that the evidence, we shouldn't not ask for evidence. The point is that when sufficient evidence is already had and one still chooses to disbelieve, he, you're acting irrationally or inappropriately. Um, so let's give one more example um, from Second Peter. Uh, and I'm giving biblical examples, by the way, to make sure that you guys know that I'm not just going to give some philosophical jaw about like why epistemology, like why we should be super concordant with the current methods of the intellectuals or the academics today. I want you to know that this is basically implied by most of the scriptures. And I'm trying to pick the hardest examples I can come up with. I even had to trim examples because of how much that I came across while doing this research. But anyway, um, we did not. This is Peter speaking to uh, the people in the letters. Uh, or the people he's writing to in Second Peter. Um, we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son in whom I, whom I love, with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven and when we were with him on the sacred mountain, when we were with him on the sacred mountain. So we have the prophetic message as something completely reliable and you do well to pay attention to it. Um, so I want to point out a couple of different passages here. Um, first of all, you have Peter um, saying a couple of things. He was not, he was careful not to fall prey to myth-making or exaggeration in this regard. And he uses this as an appeal to his audience. He appeals to himself and the people he was around as eyewitnesses. We were there. We saw this. We can be trusted and relied upon. And he indicates his own level of confidence in it, that it's completely reliable. But within what? In the prophecy of the coming of Christ, given what he did, we saw his majesty and now we believe him. Um, this isn't done in a vacuum. In effect, he's saying, I saw his glory, therefore I believe his message. And that is a perfectly reasonable assertion. It's the same as I saw the atom hit the other atom. And then I, you know, I believe the atom was split by the hitting of the atoms. It's the exact same sort of conditional that you would expect from any scientist in any laboratory anywhere else. Um, and this isn't done in a vacuum. Uh, Acts 1, 3 and Luke 1, 1 through 4 are Luke appealing to Theophilus, his, uh, the person he was writing to in his letter, that I carefully, like you guys can look these verses up if you'd like, I carefully looked through these, um, through, through the evidence. I compiled an orderly account for you. I wanted you to understand that these are compelling proofs. Jesus appeared to these people after he was dead uh, and then raised to life again. 40 days, uh, for 40 days, he was eating with people. He was out with people. He gave them many reasons to believe these things. And uh, f funny enough, in uh, John 20, 30 and 31, right after Thomas confesses my Lord and my God and Jesus says, blessed are you who have uh, not seen and yet believed, John literally pens the words, these things are written that you might believe. And I thought that that was, I thought that that was super compelling that this is not just something, this is not just like a couple of one-off passages that make it seem like, oh, we can be rational sometimes, but for the most part, we put our faith in one pocket and our reason in the other. No, we are consistently imprecated throughout scripture by gospel writers to be using evidence to vet hypotheses or not even hypotheses, but our beliefs towards these things. So I would say in conclusion from those 
texts and from others. I think the biblical sense of faith that maybe if you're going for, if you're looking at the Merriam-Webster dictionary would be credit, the act of trusting in a source, which is tried and true. And that source would be, um, would be uh, probably Holy scripture in this situation. But if you're talking about the way the writers were writing, Thomas should have known better um, the writer of Hebrews was trying to say, because of all of these things that were written that you guys believe in already. And Peter was trying to say that we have, um, we have ample evidence to believe these things and therefore we ought to. It would be irrational not to. Okay. So some historical counterexamples to this dictionary sort of definition, the Dawkinsian definition um, is an interesting one. Um, first, just to re-motivate it a little bit in your minds, in case you were wondering what Dan Dennett thinks about this, I know you guys were probably chomping at the bit to see that. If you think that this is that this common but unspoken understanding about faith is anything better than a socially useful obfuscation to avoid mutual embarrassment and loss of faith, then either you've seen much more deeply into this issue than any philosopher has, for none has come up with a good defense for this, or you are kidding yourself. Um, that's the sort of prevailing attitude among new atheists about faith. And I find that really shocking, given what uh, Lewis and others have actually said about faith. Uh, moreover, Freud, and this is before even the modern times you have, uh, or before like current scholars, you have um, people like Freud saying, if ever there was a case of a lame excuse, we have it here. Ignorance is ignorance. No right to believe anything can be derived from it. In other matters, no sensible person will behave so irresponsibly or rest so content with such feeble ground for, grounds for his opinions than for the line he takes. Where questions of religion are concerned, people are guilty of every possible sort of dishonesty and intellectual misdemeanor. Now, I find this really frustrating because it's like when I look back at, hang on, yeah. When I look back at uh, this, this definition of, of faith, I, I agree with him. If there's no evidence or proof for anything that's being said by a person of faith, I, I get the impression they're probably right. Freud and, and Dennett and even Dawkins are probably correct. But I gotta be honest, like I, I don't even think it's possible to believe, like metaphysically possible. Now I don't have arg I don't have time to argue that. I'm actually thinking about doing a little bit more investigation into this afterwards. You guys can take it with you if you want. But I'm, I'm getting the impression that when I think this through, I don't think it's possible to metaphysically come to a conclusion with no premises. Even if you woke up with a head injury and, and you couldn't tell causally the head injury and the rewiring of the synapses of your brain and the refirings of those things when you regain consciousness is partly involved in that. And if somebody were describing it third person, they would be seeing something like that. So I'm not even sure that this definition of faith is metaphysically possible, um, but I, I probably have to put that to the side. What I do think though, is the biblical data seems to indicate something other than what Dawkins and Dennett and Freud are pushing. And I think that it has to do with being, uh, giving full credit where credit is due. Um, so, uh, and for that reason, for yet another reason, I would believe somebody like John Locke. Uh, historically, Locke is, people are, are undecided about whether he's a theist or not, but let's just go with he's a theist. He says some things that sound like it here. Faith is nothing but a firm assent of the mind which if it be regulated as is our duty, cannot be afforded to anything but upon good reason and so cannot be opposed to it. He that believes without having any reason for his believing may be in love with his own fancies, but neither seeks truth as he ought nor pays the obedience due to his maker who would have him use those discerning faculties he has given him to keep him out of mistake and error. So Locke, who is a, a radical empiricist uh, philosopher in history is, is claiming that if you don't, if you don't try to put forth your best foot by using your faculties and using the, the, your God-given senses, you're in the wrong. And I think that that's powerful. And then you have Newton who said, uh, he who thinks half, he who thinks half heartedly will not believe in God, but he who really thinks has to believe in God. And there's a myriad of other quotes like this. And so for those reasons, I do think that, um, the, the faith as like credit towards a, a given person who ought to be trusted is the better notion of faith. So I'm going a little fast, but Man, eh, you, you guys are probably better off. You don't want to keep hearing this. So I really want to get to the Q&A. Um, does, does faith involve evidence? I think it does. And I'm going to have to argue for that now. Um, let's move on. Um, so there are two relevant things in play here. Christians are, Christians have to do two things when they're, when they're um, with faith in God, faith in theism and things like this. They have to um, assent to a proposition originally or a set of propositions originally. And they have to uh, preserve or adhere their faith over time. 
um, they have to keep to the faith. They have to uh, keep the faith, run the race, finish well. They're constantly told to do this. Now, Lewis quotes, it's going to be, I'm going to be quoting a lot of him at length here because I really didn't have time to boil this down as I should. So please bear with me. Uh, we've been told that scientists, um, that the scientists think uh, it his duty to proportion his strength of his belief exactly to the evidence, to believe less as there is less evidence and to withdraw belief altogether when reliable adverse evidence shows up. We have also been told on the contrary that Christians regard it as positively, positively praiseworthy to believe evidence or in excessive evidence or maintain his belief unmod unmodified in the teeth of steady increasing evidence against it. We must be wary of confusion uh, between the way in which a Christian first assents to his propositions and the way in which he afterwards adheres to them. And they must be carefully distinguished. So I'm going to try and do that. So what is the first original assent kind of composed of? Um, so you're looking at, um, you, you, if you look at the difference between what a Christian is doing when they decide to believe in a proposition versus what a scientist is deciding to do when they believe in a proposition. Um, I, I don't think that they're as different as maybe they seem on their face. And let me give you two examples. And maybe you guys can kind of just take a look at these and you know mull it over for a little bit. Um, so compare when a Christian a sense to the statement, uh, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And a Christian says, I believe that. A Christian commits or assents or gives credence to that proposition. And then a materialist scientist says something like, the speed of light is constant between any two points A and B. Um, what makes these two items of knowledge different? Um, the materialist, when presented with some proof for a miracle or something, or, or, or H2O or something like this, or I'm sorry, when, when he's presented with proof of a miracle, might realize he can't come to some demonstrative certainty that the miracle did not happen. But this mere possibility, the idea that a miracle could happen, is probably not going to shake his conviction for materialism. Just because some Christian walks in the room and says, Jesus, turn water to wine, believe it or go to hell. Um, I don't think they would change their idea on that just because of that, even if they couldn't present like quick, fast and in a hurry, some proof off the top of their head, why uh, that couldn't happen uh, any more than they would just drop the idea that light, the speed of light is constant between any two points A and B. Um, and I think that the Christian similarly does not necessarily claim to have demonstrative proof, but the formal possibility that God might not exist is not necessarily present in the form of the least actual doubt. Belief in this sense seems to me to be an assent to a proposition which we think so overwhelmingly probable that there is a psychological exclusion of doubt, though not a logical exclusion of dispute. And this is an important thing. I really want you guys to try and take this in. I know I'm going quickly. Uh, but I really want you guys to try and take this in. I think that this is something that we have to deal with in apologetics all the time. Whether you're an atheist or either side of the line you land on, you have to deal with this, um, this sort of psychological exclusion of doubt, though not a logical exclusion of dispute. For the most part, when we argue in worldview disputes, we don't come to some QED moment where it, it has been demonstrated anything. Um, for the most part, we have um, different relative uh, feelings or intuitions of certainty. We can integrate certain things easier into our belief structures or our noetic structures easier than other things. And I think that for the most part, when we're presented with these things, like if a Christian is presented with, uh, oh, Jesus isn't the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus didn't even exist. Or somebody says, like, science isn't the real way to God. In the beginning, uh, God created the heavens and the earth, and we have a catastrophist view of the history of science. So all of these laws that you think have been all the way in the past, uh, all the way from the beginning, they're not necessarily like that because when God was shaping the universe, it wasn't like that. I don't think a Christian or a materialist being challenged in either of those ways would be significantly shaken in their faith. Um, and this is because of this psychological sort of... Um, yeah, this, this sort of psychological exclusion of doubt even though it's not perfectly logically demonstrated that it's not the case that they're, that they could ever be wrong. Um, so all men alike on questions, which interest them, Lewis says, um, escape from the region of belief into that of knowledge when they can, if they succeed in knowing, they no longer say they believe in something. The mathematician's way of doing this is by reasoning. The scientist's way is by experiment. The historian's way is by documents and the judge his way is by concurring sworn testimony. But all these men as men on questions outside their own disciplines have numerous beliefs to which they do not normally apply their methods of their own discipline. You don't give uh, laboratory um, credence to something that doesn't merit laboratory treatment. Um, history is a big example of this because historical 
things can only be accepted by the records. They can't be repeated in laboratories. You can't change um, these things in that way. You have to just sort of accept uh, what's said by the documents and go off of that. So the different proofs you would use in different um, magisteria are, is gonna be different. And I think that that applies in a way that I'll get to in a second. Okay, so I, I'll ask you to do a thought experiment with me. Imagine a scientist who happens to be a jealous wife. If she were to find some evidence of her husband's infidelity, ought she assume that it is possible her husband is unfaithful? Should she, with the same prejudice and impartiality that she uses in a laboratory, investigate him? Should she stick to her story regardless and always sink her teeth into any bit of evidence just to make sure it's not true that he's, that he's cheating? Um, I think not. I think that um, these things just simply don't undergo that laboratory treatment at all. They're just being mistreated that way. Um, and I think that Christians and scientists in this way and other academics are sent to propositions in re relevantly similar ways. We need to make sure our standard of proof and evidence is appropriate to the subject matter in which it's, in which it's being presented. We can't expect mathematical certainty from certain propositions that are in the humanities because it's just not available. It's spoken in a different language. Math is its own language and history is going to be its own language. And they have to be tested by their own, or history is going to be talked about in its own language. And it has to be tested in its own way that's proven reliable. And we ought to stick to those reliabilities, even though it's not as demonstrable as we would have liked. If a judge were to wait for some sort of mathematical proof to be solved, like, yeah, I don't know, uh, you know like uh, high, yeah, some, some mathematical proof that Joel would probably, Joel's probably rolling off like six of them off his tongue right now in the audience. Um, if a judge were to wait for that in order, like I need this in order to convict this person of this crime, um, he would be being ridiculously unreasonable. And I think it is unreasonable to present uh, the wrong evidence for the wrong things. So, but that doesn't really settle the question um, what it, adherence to a set of propositions over time does. Why ought we have obstinacy in belief as Lewis puts it? Um, because Christians do praise an adherence as if it were meritorious. And even in a sense, more meritorious, the stronger the apparent evidence against their faith becomes. They, become, they even warn one another against such apparent contrary evidence, such as trials of faith and temptations of doubt. They may be expected to occur and determine in advance to resist them. Is this bad? Is this a bad thing? Like, because scientists don't do that. But I will say that it does seem like the, the jealous wife scientist does seem to do that in other ways. If she doesn't apply her laboratory treatment to her husband, the way she would apply it to her experiments, I think that she uh, is, is acting appropriately. And I think adherence over time is going to be appropriate in a specific sense in which I'll outline. Um, there are times when we can do all that a fellow creature needs of us, if only he will trust us. In getting a dog out of a trap, in extracting a, uh, a thorn from a child's finger, in teaching a boy to swim, or rescuing one who can't, in getting a frightened beginner over a nasty place on a mountain, one fatal obstacle to them might be their distrust. And this is going to become a, a, a more relevant issue when I kind of say this is the sort of magisteria we're making the, the sort of theological or religious decisions in. There's going to be a specific sort of evidence that we can't apply or that we ought not to apply even um, that we should apply in these spaces that we shouldn't in others. And so I think it makes for a different, um, it's a horse of a different color. So uh, consider a climber. Um, you imagine that you're scaling the face of Big Sur when you spot a terrified climber. Um, you can only see one way of rescuing the person. And the only way they can do it is by risking a very dangerous jump. Now picture this person is petrified. They're on the side of a mountain. You're an experienced climber. You know what's safe and what isn't. You have skill and confidence, but they don't. Then their fear and other things are, are clouding their judgment. Um, you have to try to convince them, even though you're a stranger in this case, you have to try to convince them that through the evidence, that though the evidence seems overwhelmingly counterintuitive, they must trust you. They must put faith in you in order to escape that specific situation. Um, again, consider a dog in a trap. Imagine finding a dog with its paw caught in a trap. And, and I put and right here. Pfft. And you see it's the sort of trap which needs to be like the paw needs to be pushed forward in order to release the paw from the trap. You can see that it's that. He can't see that or she can't see that. But it's, it's one of those things that, you can see that they can't and they couldn't possibly understand what you're gonna to do to them. All they can understand is that you're gonna hurt them more to cause their freedom. You're gonna hurt them more to cause the relief of their pain and they can't possibly understand that. But it is something that they will have to trust if they're to escape from this. They need to trust you. That's a fatal flaw in their reasoning to not trust you in this situation. 
And so um, Lewis goes on, he says, we are asking them to trust in the teeth of their senses, their imagination and their intelligence. We ask them to behave uh, or believe what is painful will relieve their pain. What looks dangerous is, all, is their only safety. If we succeed, we do so only because they have maintained their faith in us against apparent contrary evidence. Um, Mark, I am not saying that the strength of our original belief must, by psychological necessity, produce such behavior. It doesn't always have to happen. The dog won't always trust you to, to get its hand out. It'll try and bite you, or maybe it'll die there. Maybe you can't help it. Um, but I am saying that the content of our original belief by logical necessity entails the proposition that such behavior is appropriate. If human life is in fact ordered by a beneficent being whose knowledge of our real needs and the way in which they can be satisfied infinitely exceeds our own, we must express expect a priori that his operations will often appear to us to be far from beneficent, far from wise, and that it will be our highest prudence to give him our confidence in spite of this. And this is what we see all throughout Hebrews 11, right? We see um, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. You have all kinds of acts of belief, which against their better judgment in a vacuum would be the case, but they assented to these propositions because they trusted God. And let me just get into why. We trust not because a God exists, but because this God exists. And that's important to believe that God, at least this God exists. And by that, I mean the God of Christianity is to believe that you as a person now stand in the presence of God as a person. What would a moment before have been variations in opinion before you decide to trust the climber, before the dog decides to trust the rescuer, or before you decide to trust Christ, now become variations in your personal attitude to a person. You are no longer faced with an argument which demands your assent, but with a person who demands your confidence. And I think that that's a really important difference when we start to switch over to the magisteria. Uh, so we we kind of have a transfer of magisteria in this area where we have to now go on a different set of evidence. We're no longer in the laboratory when we decide God is, uh, if, if you originally assent to the propositions of Christianity, that God is, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, that, that, uh, that he can save you from your sins and things like this. Keeping your faith is not the same as it is where you're assenting to brand new propositions and the sort of ebb and flow of the evidence that comes your way. You're now in a different sort of relation. You're in a relation to a person. Our opponents then, and the opponents of Christianity, he means, have a perfect right to dispute with us about the grounds of our original assent. Um, they could say it's illogical to have treated God as a person. They could say that it's illogical to trust historical documents beyond what maybe is, is, is fruitful in practical life. But they must not accuse us of sheer insanity. If after the assent has been given, our adherence to it is no longer proportioned to every fluctuation of the apparent evidence. Like the dog in the trap or like the climber on the side of the mountain, you are now in a different position. You've already decided to climb the mountain, but now you have to trust that you can do it based on your relation to a person. So the ascent of necessity moves us from the logic of speculative thought into what might be perhaps called the logic of personal relations. What would up till then have been variations simply of opinion become variations of conduct by a person to a person, a, a, me or somebody like me to God. Credir diem esse uh, turns into credir in diem. So credir diem esse means uh, like belief in God or uh, and then turns into uh uh, or I'm sorry, Kredirm at then as a belief, uh, belief that God exists uh, or turns into um, Kredir in Diem, which is belief in God. And Diem here is this God, the infinitely knowable Lord. Mm -hmm.